my screen shared here. All right, can everyone see that? Perfect. So hi everyone, uh, as Emma said, my name is Emily. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for joining me today at this uh, summer webinar. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I, I want to thank MTRI for having me. Uh, I've been able to work with some of the staff from uh, their organization this summer on some other research projects, and it's been a really good time. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of the research that I've done with you guys as well. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the University of New Brunswick, because uh, that's where I'm doing my research from, and my uh, committee as well that's um, through the university, and also the uh, Department of Lands and Forestry and the staff for providing the resources and guidance to make this research possible. Um, so my research topic and title of my research is, as you guys can see on my title page, uh, an empirical study of the success successional dynamics and structural complexities occurring in Nova Scotia's coastal black spruce communities. Mm. Trying to get my slide to move, there we go. <laughs> Um, so a little outline uh, before we get going. I'm going to do a little introduction mostly to uh, forest succession and development. Uh, I, I imagine there's a scale on here from people that have a really good understanding of uh, ecological processes that occur. Um, but then I know people that are on here as well that my friends and family that uh, they have very minimal knowledge and background. So I just want to have a brief introduction to um, uh, forest succession. Uh, next, I want to move into some of the old growth definitions and um, talk about broad and more um, categorized definitions of old growth. Uh, then we're going to apply that to the boreal forests, uh, particularly the interior and the coastal. Uh, then we'll take more of a dive into the coastal boreal and the natural disturbance regimes occur occurring in uh, that forest type. Then we'll look at my research statement, my research design, and moving, moving forward, what I'm hoping that this research will uh, provide for uh, the future. So without further ado, let's get on. Um, so succession, um, sec, let me get my, my notes. OK, so. Succession involves the changes in both structural and composition characteristics at stand and landscape levels. Um, although stand succession is not a discrete or linear process, uh, in the absence of stand replacing disturbances, most forests develop through four main successional stages. The first being stand initiation, second, stand exclusion, third, understory reinitiation, and old growth. Also, can people see when I move my mouse on here at all? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I can point at stuff. Perfect. Um, so the first stage is a stand initiation stage, and this happens after a stand replacing disturbances. New individuals um, begin to grow, and these are typically pioneer species, and they continue to grow for several years. The next stage is the stand exclusion stage. Um, this is when new individuals stop appearing and existing ones begin to die off. The surviving individuals begin to grow and exhibit different heights and diameters. The species dominating the stand may change at this point. The next stage is the understory reinitiation stage. Um, this is when the forest herb, shrub, and regeneration layer begin to appear again in the understory and they slow, and, and they're slow growing and suppressed under the canopy. And the last and final stage is the old growth stage. And this is when the overstory trees begin to die off in irregular fashion uh, due to small scale disturbances, allowing the understory trees that have been suppressed to grow into the canopy. The beginning and, and end of each of these stages differs across regions and forest types and is heavily reliant on the, a, the forest type and the disturbance type and frequency. Um, typically, forests develop through two main developmental pathways. The first is uh, even age stand structure, and the second is uneven age stand structure, which we will get into in the next slides. 
So even aid stands are more widely understood because the, the process is less complicated than the under uneven age stands. Um, through this process, a stand is initiated by a major disturbance or maintained by um, allowing the remaining or maintained through minor disturbances. Um, through a major disturbance, all the dominant trees are replaced, um, allowing a new cohort to grow. In the case of minor disturbances, um, few trees dry off, die off. However, the present trees dominate the newly created space, resulting in a single cohort uh, dominating the overstory. And that's why it's also referred to as a single cohort stand structure. The next is uneven age stand development. Um, this occurs through minor disturbances. Through these minor disturbances, gaps are created, allowing uh, the suppressed trees like down here, uh, to fill into the openings. Therefore, there are multiple uh, cohorts from different disturbance disturbances occupying the canopy. Um, this process is called gap phase dynamics, uh, and I'll be referring to this process or this mechanism throughout the slideshow. So in both of these pathways, natural disturbances are a core mechanism that dictates the successional pathway in the amount of forests that are in the old growth stage. Uh, in forest management, in forest management uh, strategies and practices aim to emulate these natural disturbances. However, um, extensive forest management results in the apparent decline in the amount and distribution of forest in the old growth stage. Um, because the public knows and research shows that old growth forests uh, have unique ecosystems and are um, niche communities for biodiversity values, provincial governments and even local governments have created policies um, that and have adapted management strategies to identify, protect, and conserve these rare and diminishing communities. Um, so recent, recent research has focused on um, specific four types in certain regions. In Eastern Canada in particular, um, lots of research has been looking into Quebec and Ontario boreal forests, which I'm going to refer to as the interior, interior boreal throughout the, um, throughout the presentation. Uh, however, there hasn't been much research conducted on the maritime boreal forest, which is located here in Nova Scotia along the Atlantic coast. So currently we have a knowledge gap in the successional development of boreal forest lake located directly along Canada's maritime coast. However, before we start discussing su the successional pathways of these boreal forests, I want to discuss the term of old growth. If you've been keeping up with the news at all lately, environmental news, any news, I guarantee you heard the buzzword old growth. However, old growth is a very vague and arbitrary term. Depending on the person, organization, province, even country, the term old growth can have a very different meaning and a very different definition. On the screen, I have a few values that are typically associated with old growth forests. And the definition can vary depending on what target value you're looking for. So in these cases, we had different ecological values that go into old forests, the different biodiversity, culture, social, even just understanding what if it's at the final stage of development. Um, depending on the target value that you're looking for, you're going to define what an old growth forest is very different. So in general, there are very broad definitions that go with old growth forests. These include definitions of being free of human disturbance or having pristine or virgin conditions or being in that final stage of the stand development as we talked about in our successional, in our successional pathway. However, these broad definitions make it very difficult to distinguish when a forest is old growth or when it's not old growth. Um, Therefore, there's typically three definition categories that um, these old growth definitions fall into. Um, and they're listed here as structural, successional, and biogeochemical. Uh, I'll 
this is a nice um, hemlock forest that I was in the other day. I just wanted to include a nice picture for you guys. Um, so the first uh, category is structural. And this is looking at quantitative or measurable characteristics of a forest. Um, typically, age is correlated with these structural characteristics. And a lot of the structural characteristics are listed here uh, in bullet point notes. So looking for old trees, uh, looking for large trees, looking for the abundance of large logs, abundance of snags, an increase in species composition, multiple layers, um, measuring the structural complexity both horizontally and vertically on the landscape, um, identifying and measuring the gaps and patches that are there, along with numerous structural characteristics that you can measure in a forest. Uh, in this case, my supervisor, Peter Bush, is, was measuring a big red spruce tree. Um, so based on these definitions, a lot of the times these characteristics are associated with age, um, and age can be used as a proxy to determine when these types of characteristics are, uh, can be identified on the landscape. Uh, the next way that um, old growth forests can also be defined is through a successional definition. Um, this is more a process-based definition um, that can be used to identify both structural but more ecological complexities that are, are occurring on the landscape. Um, in, that, in this case, um, measuring, uh, identifying when the gap phase dynamics or tree replacement is occurring, um, when climax for, uh, species are dominating the forest, um, when it reaches that stage of stand development, um, and even identifying when uh, stand age exceeds the lifespan of species. Um, typically, these process-based or successional uh, definitions um, use forest modeling to uh, identify when a forest reaches these different thresholds. Uh, however, it's not as easily to uh, measure and quantify and uh, figure it out on the on the landscape and the last one is biogeochemical so biogeochemical refers to the natural cycle of living and non-living elements and how they transfer back into the natural environment or the ecosystem that it's from um, this includes the, the natural decay of um, logs the nutrient retention in the ecosystem um, and even as i have pictured here identifying complex food webs that are associated with certain animals. So these types of definitions, although they can explain the complexity of the ecos ecosystem within that forest, um, it's really hard to quantify. And these, these measurements are usually quite expensive and labor intensive to use. So that's why most definitions end up looking at the structural characteristics uh, to identify when forests are meeting that old growth threshold uh, and they can create specific definitions based on these quantitative measurements. So now that we have kind of a general understanding of the different um, ways that you can define old growth forest or just define an older forest, um, I want, we want to apply uh, this knowledge to the boreal forest. And one way, at least one strategy that we can use to manage forests for multiple values, including old forests and biodiversity, is through an ecosystem-based management approach. Uh, an ecosystem-based management approach focuses on the specific forest type and the natural disturbance regimes occurring within that forest. So when referencing the boreal forest, there's typically three main disturbances that um, are part of the natural disturbance regime. The first is fire. The second is spruce budworm. And the third is our, our wind events. Um, so I'm going to be talking about these three, um, the, the major disturbances that are occurring within the interior boreal and as well as the coastal boreal. Um, in the case of the interior boreal forest, black spruce is the main forest or species type that dominates the landscape. Um, it is also understood as a climax species. 
and it has the ability to reproduce through small and large scale disturbances. Um, that's why most of a lot of the research coming from the interior boreal focuses on the black spruce forest types. Um, previous knowledge of the interior boreal forest suggests that these forests primarily develop through even age scan development, the main disturbance agent being fire. Um, and from previous knowledge, the rotation period, although it varies across Canada and uh, across Ontario, Quebec, the approximate rotation period has, is estimated to be between 72 and 100 years. However, recently, um, recent research suggests that in the absence of stand replacing fires, the interior boreal forest can replace through gap phase dynamics, uh, a process that we talked about before. This process, this research suggests that structural diversity increases as stands temporally develop and results in increased biodiversity. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this research suggests, as I said, that structural diversity increases and that there's increased biodiversity um, as they temporally develop. Um, some of the old stand characteristics that I found in some of the interior boreal research is that these older stands exhibit larger live and dead trees, both in height and in DBH. Um, there's an increase in the canopy gap percentage, so the opening of the canopy. There's an increase in the structural diversity of uh, dead wood, also a decrease in the basal area and a decrease in the species, uh, species tree diversity. In order to understand uh, these pathways, numerous uh, researchers have made successional models or successional paths uh, to account for when uh, these stages are occurring. Um, these are just three right now and don't be too overwhelmed. Uh, I'm not gonna get too much too into these models, but the main thing I wanted to show was that uh, in all of these instances, uh, in this model, in this model, and in these models, um, gap dynamics is present and they are present in the older stands uh, of these interior boreal forests. Now we're going to take a look at the coastal boreal. Um, as we said before, there's currently a knowledge gap on um, what's occurring on these coastal boreal sites. Um, so through the ecosystem-based management approach, we want to look at the forest type and the disturbances that are occurring. occurring. So the forest type on the coastal boreal uh, that we are looking at is black spruce. Uh, similar to the interior, interior boreal, it dominates maritime coastal boreal landscape. Uh, black spruce is also identified as a climax maritime boreal species, and that's identified through our old forest policy. And it's also shown that uh, black spruce can reproduce through small and large scale disturbances. However, previous knowledge on natural disturbances in that area estimates that 72% of that area develops through large scale disturbances, seven through small scale, and zero is estimated through the gap dynamics. So that's previous knowledge. Right now, there's um, a report with the department that's updating these uh, natural disturbance uh, return intervals and regimes. Um, so that recent research is what I'm going to be talking about in the next couple slides, uh, along with some other research I've done. So to gain a, a better understanding of what the, the natural disturbance regimes are actually occurring on the landscape, I want to break down into our the fire, spruce budworm, and wind events that are occurring in this region. I want to start with fire first because, as I mentioned before, in the interior interior boreal, uh, fire is the main di disturbance uh, agent. Uh, however, in Nova Scotia, the true natural fire cycle is a very contentious issue. Uh, we have both a natural and a human-related fire regimes, and um, looking back, research has shown um, that both these have played a factor in how our forests have developed. Um, so in the next two slides, I'm going to talk about the natural fire cycle and also, um, and then the next one will be about the human-related regimes. So 
in this timeline that I created, I, I it's based on um, Green's research on uh, lake sediment and charcoal sediments in, in lakes, um, pollen and charcoal sediments in lakes. Um, I have on the side here is the fire intensity or fi fire frequency depending on the, the, the time. So um, at the beginning here, this is post glaciation, uh, which is was approximately 10,000 to 9,000 years before present. Um, and after the glaciers occurred, uh, spruce and fir and more conifers dominated the landscape. Um, spruce in particular, and this allowed for a very high fire regime and fire frequency. However, as um, the climate began to warm, uh, we started to see spruce not dominating. And in between 9,000, 6,000 years before present, uh, pine and uh, tolerant, intolerant hardwoods started to dominate the landscape. Because of the hardwood component in the forest, the fire uh, regime frequency end up falling and being less common. Um, with the increase of climate continuing, this allowed for uh, climax species that we see now, uh, which would be our sugar maple, uh, yellow birch, even beech, um, they began to dominate the landscape between 6,000 and 4,000 before present, and this kept the fire frequency low because of the hardwood component um, dominating our landscape. Now to 4,000 to, to present, um, the climate began to cool again, resulting in uh, spruce and more conifers being uh, integrated into the forest. And that has allowed for more of an equilibrium uh, fire regime on our landscape. However, fire is still very evident in our uh, on our in Nova Scotia. This is evident of uh, by seeing the um, the fire liking species such as jack pine, which you can see in at Purcell's Cove. Um, and also red oak, and this is a picture of some of the research we did with MTRI this summer. Um, both these are fire loving species and you can still see this across the landscape and know that fire is still very prevalent um, in how our forests develop. However, as I discussed, there is also a human element to the fire frequency. Um, there is research done on the Mi'kmaq First Nations. Uh, however, there is minimal evidence that wildfire originated from their practices. When Europeans began to explore and settle between 15,000 and 1914, um, there was increase in the fire regime because of uh, rampant fires and uh, the use of fire on the landscape. And now, even with um, even with the uh, species composition that we have, the current fire suppression, because of for current fire suppression techniques, we are experiencing less fires than we did even years ago. So looking at these two regimes, it's, it's, it's evident that both the natural and human elements are contributing to our, uh, the succession of our forests. Uh, this is a map compiled from Taylor um, and Taylor tells uh, current um, natural disturbance uh, paper. And you can see, um, because we're able to have historical records of fires now, you can see the locations of um, the fires uh, from the 1950s all the way up to the 2000s. Uh, it's been identified that there's a few areas that have less uh, fire occurrences, and that's in the Cape Breton Highlands the western inlands, the eastern inlands, and along the eastern coast. And this just shows from this uh, picture that there is a temporal variation of fire frequency across the province and across um, much of the landscape in Nova Scotia. And in terms of the fire return interval or annual percent of fire that we see, there's been numerous research, numerous research that has been done on uh, the frequency of fire in Nova Scotia. Um, 
if you look at the first line here, it, uh, for now, he estimated that the return intervals was around 500 years um, with estimates up to 2000 years. And the most recent estimate, which is the last one here, estimates that uh, the return interval of uh, fire on the landscape is approximately every 600 years. So that's much higher than what we see on the interior boreal. And um, I'm assuming it's, it's an assumption that it's much, much higher than um, what sp the species can outlive. So fire is typically not a prevalent disturbance that we're seeing along um, in Nova Scotia. The next one is the spruce budworm. Um, this map, this image is kind of overwhelming, I understand, but I just wanted to show uh, kind of a timeline of uh, the outbreaks that we see. So you can see um, an outbreak back in 1912, and uh, red indicates a very severe outbreak, and yellow indicates uh, a moderate and green is light. Um, so you can see just looking across the timeline of the spruce budworm activity, and if you can notice, most of the activity is occurring in Cape Breton, um, and even in 1953 along the mainland, northern mainland. Um, however, there is a distinct line between southern and northern Nova Scotia that we can even see in that other map. Uh, spruce budworm is not frequented on the southern side of Nova Scotia, and from the compilation before and even um, the collaboration of this map, it shows that little to no spruce budworm, ha budworm activity has happened um, in, the, uh, in the majority of the maritime boreal coast. So the return interval for that particular area is over 2,000 years. So also not a very prevalent natural disturbance. And a third natural disturbance are wind events. So wind events, um, the intensity and severity is uh, looked at through the wind throw probability. And this is based on the resistance threshold of a stand and the occurrence of strong winds. Um, in Nova Scotia, we typically experience two major wind events. The first one is wind storms and the second is hurricanes. So I'll be talking about those in the next two slides, in the next coming slides. So in, this, in the case of wind storms, wind storms are wind events that, that experience 50 to 100 kilometer hour winds. Um, they're usually defined as extra tropical cyclones or also known, I know a lot of times in Nova Scotia as nor'easters. Um, and they're also tropical, can be defined as tropical storms. Um, 27, I forget exactly before, I forget when I said that the 27 tropical storms, but um, recently there's been 20, seven tropical storms averaging approximately one every four years. Uh, the most recent one was Dorian in 2019 with sustained winds of up to 65 kilometers an hour. Uh, the table below uh, is a compilation of the information in uh, Taylor Etel's uh, article. And it shows that for high, moderate, and low severity, there's different intervals return and mean annual disturbance rates depending on the severity of the wind. Um, so high severity, which is having more than 60% of the down tree mass occurring, occurs only every five, approximately maybe 5,000 years. And that's the same for moderate, so 30 to 60% of the down tree biomass. But we see here for low tree biomass, which is five to 30, uh, the return interval is only 71 years or 1.4 uh, mean annual disturbance, which is, um, much more common than every five five thousand years, and then in the case of hurricanes, hurricanes are defined as um, a wind event that's greater than 104 kilometers an hour or sustained winds of 119 kilometers an hour. Uh, they can be categorized uh, into five categories based on Sapphire and Simpson's um, categories. Uh, between 1919 and 2018, uh, we experienced 13 S S1 and SS4 and four SS4 hurricanes, equaling out to approximately one hurricane every seven years. Um, here is the an image from Taylor Tell's paper again, uh, showing the tracks of these different hurricanes coming across Nova Scotia. Um, the most recent 
her uh, SS2 hurricane was Hurricane Juan, which um, created lots of destruction both in the city and in our forested landscape. Um, to get an understanding of the damage that was caused to the forest, uh, Nova Scotia Land uh, Department of Lands and Forestry staff identified 91,484 hectares of wind damage through aerial photography and uh, lands that five imagery. And similar to the wind storm, I completed uh, Taylor Tell's information into uh, this table. Um, and similar to before, we have high, low, high, moderate, and low severity. Um, and when you're looking over at the return interval as well, um, having a high severity storm interval is every 1,250 years, moderate 714 years, and low severity 1,111 years. So still not as a prevalent um, disturbance occurring in Nova Scotia. So from all that background research, I know it's a lot to take in, but from that background research, it's evident that the low severity wind storms that are occurring every 70, approximately every 71 years is the prevalent natural disturbance occurring in Nova Scotia. From this, I created a hypothesis, and my hypothesis is that gap phase dynamics is prevalent in this area, resulting in uneven age sand develop sand structure and increased structural complex complexity as sand temporally develop. In order to um, answer this hypothesis, uh, I looked at a chrono sequence of two ecocyte groups and compared the temporal dynamics of the successional and structural attributes across in between the stands. Um, and for people that don't know what uh, chrono sequence is, it's pretty much getting um, a different stand at a different age um, so that I can look at the, the, um, the gradient of ages rather than having to go back to the same stand every year and do measurements. I can have a younger stand all the way up to an older stand, and that's what the chrono sequence is. So for this, I have four main objectives. My first objective is to see if forest trans, to answer the question of do forest transition from even age to uneven age stand along that chrono sequence. My second objective is to see if, is there gap dynamics, prev, is gap dynamics prevalent as a stand temporally develops. My third, objective is to see is there a difference in the structural complexity depending on the temporal condition of the stand. And finally, I want to see how these findings compare to the interior boreal that we talked about earlier. So in order to look at this, I, I, I wanted to look, focus on one region and uh, we end up, I end up choosing the uh, Eastern Shore Eco District. Um, the Eastern Shore Eco District, which we ha I have highlighted in red here, um, it is the coldest eco district on the mainland uh, due to climate and the influ influence by the ocean. Um, it also experiences strong winds, extended periods of fog. Um, this all, all these different characteristics allow it to uh, have the maritime boreal forest. Uh, and it was also identified that through settlement patterns, uh, it had the highest prospect of finding natural undisturbed forests along Nova Scotia's shore. Um, so for my research design, um, I, 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 I need to focus on uh, identifying these sites along the chrono sequence. However, research suggests that site productivity uh, influences the succession rate of a stand. So the more pro productive a site is, it actually increases succession rate. Um, that's why I decided to divide my um, groups, my group into two separate groups, my sample size into two separate groups. Um, and this was distinguished by distinguishing ecocytes. So ecocytes are identified as units that share similar site productivity based on moisture and nutrient regimes. Um, so based on the eco site, I was able to categorize uh, a stand as either being an upland black spruce site or a lowland black spruce site. From identifying that I need two separate stands, I then needed to find my stands. Um, my stands were then identified through using uh, PSP data, which is permanent sample plot data, um, FEC 
forest ecosystem classification data, our forest inventory data through Nova Scotia, and historical re records and local, local knowledge of the area. Um, my, once my stands were identified, my plots were then determined through a systematic site selection approach. And this would allow for my stands to be um, replicates that uh, cover, systematically cover the entire stand. So through this method, I end up having a nested uh, research design. Um, so I have my, each of my groups has 10 stands. And for each of those 10 stands, I have three plots, equaling 30 plots total for um, each of my groups and um, resulting in my sample size being 20 stands and my replicas being 60 replicates. So, now my sampling, now I'm going to talk about my sampling methods. So once my plots, my stands were identified, my plots were identified, I was able to go to the plot center and we would first get a soil type and a vegetation type because based on the soil type and vegetation type, I can determine whether it was the upland or lowland site. Next, I would do a, a prism sweep and whatever trees fell into my back to prism sweep, um, we would, um, measure the diameter, the height, uh, the core, each tree, determine the status of the tree and the species of the tree. So as you can see here, some of my workmates and supervisors were helping me get some ages of this lowland black spruce site. Uh, after all the characteristics of the trees were collected, we also did a gap fraction, which was from plot center. We'd have 25, uh, a 25 meter transect, five 20 minute 25 meter transects out from plot center to get an accurate representation of uh, the canopy opening. And finally, we would do a downwoody assessment, which from plot center, which would be here, uh, we do 30 meter uh, transects in a, tri in a triangle shape to um, understand to, and measure the, the coarse woody that fell along those lines, as well as identify the species and decay. Um, condition of the of the the course woody debris. In the end, these are all the characteristics I am, I ended up um, measuring at each of the sites. So I end up measuring some structural uh, parameters as well as successional parameters. Um, I, I won't go through each of them, but um, moving forward, I'm going to be uh, analyzing the structural and successional characteristics to meet my objectives that I identified earlier. So moving forward, uh, as I just mentioned, I'm going to be statistically interpreting the data to answer my hypothesis and objectives um, and hopefully come to some definitive conclusions. I'm also going to be comparing these findings to the interior boreal and possibly other forest types that uh, share similar forest compositions. Um, I also hope, uh, I, I, I also want to make clear is that my, my research is not focusing on what is and what is not an old growth black spruce forest. I, I'm not trying to create a definition for a black spruce forest. However, I'm, what I'm hoping that my research can do is be used as a tool for improved forest management practices um, so that foresters and uh, biologists and people working in the industry can make improved and educated dis management decisions. And finally, um, I I'm hoping that my data can be used as a reference point for the current forest dynamics occurring um, for future climate change modeling projections. Uh, as I think we all have heard in the news already, we uh, were in for a very severe storm season this year. And that's what is going to be projected for the foreseeable future. So um, with increase in occurrence and severity of wind events um, in the future, these disturbance regimes could change. And uh, I'm hoping that my research can be used as a reference point in 2020 of how these forests are naturally developing. Those are my references. And that is my presentation. Ooh. Thank you so much, Emily. That was fantastic. We all come back, we unzoom and come back to normal. <laughs> um, all right, at this point, uh, I would absolutely open up the floor for discussion. I'm sure somebody has some questions for Emily. Uh, and if you do, 
go ahead and take yourself off mute and we can go back and forth. I posted a couple of questions on the chat thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Would you like me to read them? Uh, well, okay. The, the first one is just, I was wondering about uh, white spruce and its overall role in the coastal forest because it's, it's my impression that on many of the headlands, it's, it's like, it's mostly white spruce on the outer edge. And I've just been kind of curious about the interaction between white spruce and black spruce. I just wanted to comment on that. Or you have any comments? I don't think I have the, uh, the knowledge to comment specifically on that. Um, like I said, I, I focused my research on the black spruce communities and yeah. that was, uh, it was identified as uh, a, a dominant, um, the dominating climax species in that area. Um, however, I, I definitely came in contact with white spruce and it definitely uh, has a role on the landscape as well. But I, 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 I can't comment. So, so on the stands that you've been looking at, it's not a significant component? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, Are they, um, I mean, that relates to my second question. My second question was, there was, um, how far inland do you, like on average, do you see that? Um, coastal boreal forest on the eastern shore extending and I'm wondering where your plots are in relation to the you know to the seaward edge yeah well Maybe I that's, have that's the big factors how far it is from the seaward edge I'm just curious about it also yeah. for wind and everything else I I couldn't find the uh, map that I have with my exact plots but the, yeah. um, the if I show my uh, the, I, there is a map of the eastern shore, so it was within the eastern shore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did. We the stands were chosen based on being black spruce dominant and based on the site productivity. Yeah. Um, so. But how far are they from the coast? That's my question. I just you know just curious. Uh, well, I didn't. I don't have a measurement for each each of my stands, but some of them were closer. Some of them were further. Like a kilometer or or. Yeah, yeah, all mess. Yeah, That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. yeah, they'd all be within a kilometer of the the coastline. Yeah. The other, I mean, if no one else want to interrupt. I mean, the other thing I kind of wonder about. I've looked at quite a few of these uh, on the eastern shore and a little bit towards the south shore, and um, you quite commonly find patches of yellow birch in them, and and some hardwoods. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes me wonder, it kind of makes me wonder how much settler influence there's been on that composition of that coastal forest, at least away from the coast. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go two or 300 meters away from the coast where you really have the strong temperature and fog influence and so on. I'm just wondering if there's been some, you know, some what they call borealization of what might have been a more mixed forest. Mm -hmm. You know, because I just wonder about seeing some of those other species there. Yeah, yeah. just a question. I, yeah, I, you know, I this is very casual observation. But we definitely ran into some uh, heartleaf birch and uh, red maple in some of our stands. Um, but I wouldn't, it was, I wouldn't say it was a common occurrence throughout all of our stands. If there's anyone else who can jump in for information for David, go ahead as well. Like, well, you can ask Peter, is when are we going to see that natural disturbance paper? <laughs> I really want to see that. I know Peter Bush wants to comment. He was here a minute ago. Maybe yeah. not. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> I was wondering when, you know, when that's going to be available to the public. Um, my understanding is it's going to be published soon so it's been accepted yeah. uh, and uh, Taylor has done some presentations on it um, so it's it's really in the, uh, the the journals privy of when it's going to be uh, released okay. um, I, 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 I can ask uh, Taylor and see if, what uh, if he has a, an exact deadline I'll get back to you okay thanks here, I've got a, this, this is John Brazner. I, I was just uh, in a meeting that Sean Basquill, who I believe is a co-author on that paper, he was thinking it was going to be in September. Yeah. The, the last they heard from the journal. 
Yeah. That's what I'm expecting, hoping to see it, yeah. Yeah, well, it's up to the journal. You know, there's not much anybody can do about the timeline except wait for them to get it out. Okay. Um, did we have, so we have a, um, a question from uh, Verdi and Chris, so I'm not sure, uh, but a question in the chat, uh, which is what was the typical age of the black spruce ceremony? Well, the age is ranged, it is very variable. So uh, uh, there's a lot of black spruce around between 80, 100, and we had a, a good amount of trees over 100 years old as well from aging. Did you find a difference in the lowland versus upland in terms so, of, like I'm, I'm not just talking about age, but in terms of the DBH relationship with age, were you finding smaller trees in the lowlands uh, at older ages? Um, well, that's kind of part of my results right now. So I, I'm still currently working on my results and my statistical methods to interpret that. So I'm hoping to get that information uh, in coming in the next month or two, but that, I don't think that's something I can comment on right now because it's, it's not definitive and I haven't been vetted of uh, how it is. For my eyeball, it's hard to tell a few centimeters here or there, but uh, yeah, just waiting for my results. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John. Any other questions for, uh, for Emily on the presentation or surrounding old growth forests or succession in general? I had a question about the um, kind of the definitions for old growth forests that you were, you were talking about at the start. And, and thank you also for, for that presentation. I feel like, um, you know, someone who has not studied forests extensively, I learned a lot. It was really, it was very interesting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, biogeochemical bio uh, as like a technique for determining if a forest is old growth or not. And I just wondered, you kind of mentioned it was like very expensive compared to the other techniques. Mm -hmm. And so it's not kind of used as much. But I wonder, if, like, do you have any more details? Like, I've, it's something I've not really heard about the biogeochemical aging of forests. And like, what, what types of things happen? Like, why is it, why is it so expensive? Well, if, so the one example I had there is the complex food web. So if you wanted to actually determine if a food web was really complex, you'd have to go and uh, survey the different animals and the different types of species that are in that unique web. So just from that labor intensive tracking and researching the diversity of animals within, within the ecosystem is quite labor intensive. Um, and then, and expensive. Um, another example I believe they, they talked about is uh, carbon sequestration and uh, measuring that and trying to quantitatively define um, when a, a forest is holding more carbon and not. So it's, it's just, it's more labor intensive and expensive than like measuring the structural characteristics. Um, and then, yeah, so in the form of biogeochemical, they're just trying to use that as a definition of seeing when um, an ecosystem is get like um, let's say giving back into itself you know like when so for uh, a food web in that sense so just you know one of the things that kind of MTRI in general and you know me in particular we're really trying to get at is just having the public increase our knowledge of you know occurrence of species in different places and so is, you know, if we were really able to get, you know, a lot of public support for learning about the species abundance in different forests, for example, would it, you know, really be able to reduce, you know, the costs of that, I guess, and mm -hmm. compared to the other techniques, like, do you think that's a, a more favorable way to? So it suggested that a combination of all the techniques is probably the, the best way, um, because you don't want to discount the structural characteristics because uh, bigger logs and snags and trees is also great habitat for uh, certain bird species and animal species. Um, so I, I think you kind of need a combination of all those different techniques to get 
a, a really good definition, but as I said before, your definition is going to change depending on what value you're really trying to look for. Right. Okay. Well, it's you know it's really kind of good news because I I assume the you know some of the easier to collect and um, you know techniques for aging forest would continue anyway. But if we're if we are able to really increase that mm -hmm. occurrence data for species, maybe we can you know as you said increase the the combination of factors so we're, yeah, we're just better able to uh, understand old growth forest. Thanks. Really, uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. I have one more question if I can ask it. Am I still there? Go for it. You're in. Yeah, I just, um, I'm curious about how much pit and mound topography you see because I look for it in some of these coastal boreal forests and I haven't seen any convincing pit and mound topography. Have you seen it? Uh, I'd probably say no as well. Because um, it requires usually trees like 150 years old and so on to, to make it. So it would be kind yeah. of inconsistent with them not reaching that age very commonly, I would think. I'm no, I, I only had the pit and mound uh, as just a, a characteristic that's seen in typical old forests. That's why yeah. I have a oh, okay. low point there. It's not one that I'm saying that you see okay. all the time in boreal forests. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I would say no, but I also, like, I've been to the, the 20 stands, so um, yeah. even though 20 stands is still well, a lot. It's a, it's a good it's sample. Okay, so it's that's, that's fine. It's, it's just, you know, just curious. Yeah. Just curious. Uh, yeah and, the, and the other thing I often find in those coastal forests, I mean, they're often on quite shallow, rocky soils and mm -hmm. stuff, so. Yeah. Kind of hard to distinguish, you know, good pit and mound from. If it's a rock or if it's an old. Yeah, everything else. So. <laughs> no, it's just, it was. Curiosity question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good Thanks. presentation. Thank you. And your your question did come up in the chat there, just very belated. Uh, so he had, he had a big long question in the chat there. It's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, so it's: Do you think that black spruce? Uh, two more. Do you think that black spruce in the area of your study will be targeted less? Uh, due to the loss of northern northern pulp, as there will be less demand for pulp wood. I, I don't know. Um, that's. I guess that's not really my study or or, or anything, but um, it's kind of hard to project that because. Um, yeah, I, I would say I don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to give my expert opinion in that. That's a fair assessment. It's a yeah. it is a large scale question. We are yeah northern pulp. Who knows. Um, and uh, Ryan McIntyre says, uh, do you plan to expand your study to boreal forests outside of Nova Scotia? I would very much love to. Yeah, that'd be, um, it'd be really cool to see how the dynamics in other forests compare to what we see here in Nova Scotia and even compare it to, once again, the research that's been done in uh, Ontario and Quebec. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. It's special that we're in the little hurricane path here and that can yeah. things significantly. So Absolutely. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna do one last call for questions and then we're nearing our uh, hour mark. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. You, it was a full presentation. Sometimes we're 20 minutes and then it's time for questions. And so I was expecting it to be 20 minutes, but I guess I was able I just want to talk and I just keep talking. So, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Okay, if no one has any other questions, then uh, I will say uh, we will wrap it up for today. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for doing this for us. Uh, this was really wonderful. Um, I will, I'll be, we'll be in touch afterwards. Uh, and just a general pitch to everybody else. Uh, next week, we're hearing from Ira Reinhardt Smith talking about uh, youth activism. Um, and we are also uh, in the time of climate change, so he does work uh, against climate change. And uh, our last week um, of the summer is the 27th, La uh, Prime and she's talking about high aluminum levels in uh, Nova Scotia's lakes and rivers. Um, so tune in for any of those. It's always the same Zoom link. Uh, yeah, and that's it for us. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your Thursday. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody. Yay. <laughs>